Welcome to the Be Legendary podcast. Um, I am Bert Soren, today's host, uh, owner, and president of Sorenex. And I have a good friend of mine today for one of our guests. And we haven't had this individual on the podcast yet, although he's one of the people in the strength world that I've known the longest. And that is Dave Spitz from Cal Strength. Welcome, Dave. Thanks, brother. I appreciate uh, you having me on. I can't wait to have an insightful and, like we talked about, potentially controversial discussion. <laughs> That's awesome. So, Dave, you are out at the pool with your kids right now, which is just very on brand for California strength yeah. and, and multitasking and just being an awesome, awesome dad and and uh, and an entrepreneur. So uh, I think that's rad. Get yeah, good on it. So if you got to grab someone from drowning or give some cues, go ahead. We'll not yeah. edit it out. Yeah, we uh, we've got to stay true to the athletic life plan of my children. <laughs> Otherwise, uh you know, it's going to be really embarrassing if my kids suck at all the sports they play. So, <laughs> yeah, that that's not good for the brand. Yeah, no pressure, kids. <laughs> that's so, awesome. If we, if we, if we don't if we don't uh, win county in the six and unders this year across the board, I'm going to be really disappointed. Yes, you might bite their fingers. <laughs> You're gonna have to elaborate on that one. <laughs> well, we'll get back to that one. Um, so, so Dave, give us a little bit uh, for those who don't know. Um, Cal Strength has been around how long at this point? Uh, what, fifteen years, close to? Well, uh, Cal Strength in its current form has been around since '08, but okay. we started as a nonprofit called AmericanWeightlifting.org. So, for some of the people that have followed Olympic style weightlifting in the United States. For the past 15 years, I initially set up uh, this 501c3 nonprofit uh, when I was training, you know, as a as a vehicle to kind of learn more about the sport and, and hopefully to, to get better at the sport myself. Training for and weightlifting, so, right? Exactly. So I, I brought over um, one of the one of the most influential and successful coaches of all time in our sport. His name was Ivan Abajiev, and he was a Bulgarian um, that you know was uh, was was responsible for creating some of the strongest athletes in the history of the sport, really in the history of the world from like the mid seventies to, you know, the, the mid to late eighties. Right. So, when everyone was talking about the Bulgarians and all this other stuff and this crazy yeah. secret C curtain that no one knew how these guys were so strong that he was at, at the epicenter of that. Yes, he was the architect of what they call the Bulgarian system. And so, you know, you're talking about a, a very, uh, oppressive form of communism in Bulgaria at that time and, you know, around 6 million people that lived in, you know, relative uh, uh, poverty. And so for them to rise to international prominence and take on the, the traditional powers of the day, you know, the, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Uh, in general, like the like the, the East Germans and, and the Romanians. Anyway, Bulgaria just came out of almost seemingly nowhere to just absolutely dominate the sport. And so he was at the helm of that. Wow, that's amazing having that type of influence and, and I guess mentorship really at the early stages of your of your weightlifting career. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately he taught me so many lessons, um, you know, none of which I expected to learn. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think often the case when you seek something out and you really don't have a, a, a firm grasp of, of exactly what you're looking for, you tend to find things that just, you know, you didn't expect that are very valuable. Yes. So, kind of going on, on, a, on a walkabout of sorts in your training uh, world. Exactly. And just kind of noticing things and picking up on things and just, you know, uh, you know, being, being, being observant. I was, uh, I was really just, um, taken aback by, you know, Hey, how this individual produced something from nothing, you know, how do you, how do you go from, from, from zero to one type thing? You know, there's no tradition of weightlifting in your country. How do you rise to prominence? And so, you know, what I learned from him, uh, was how to keep your own counsel and how to, how to make sure that, you know, you stay true to your convictions and what you believe to be right, uh, and not and not get swayed by by opinions and and, and commentary of others. Well, wow, that that's an amazing feat. Uh, I, I would think in the eighties and seventies it was a little bit more um, easy to do, but in today's world with social media and internet and all the other influences, like, are you able to do that, or is it just an impossibility in today's world? in the current iteration of Cal strength. 
Dude, I think it is such, it's so difficult. Um, in, in, in Cal Strength, you know, I've, I've always like backed that up as a, as a cornerstone of, of just, you know, us having individual ideas where, you know, we're going to, we're going to do what we believe to be right. And then, you know, not necessarily pop our heads up and look around and see if what we're doing is correct. Just let the success of the athletes be the metric by which we judge our activities. And so to that end, that's why I've always been really drawn to, you know, objective realities uh, with respect to the sports that we participate in. So whether it's Olympic style weightlifting, where we have uh, a number that's on the bar that we can gauge our success from, or whether it's the NFL scouting combine where, you know, we have these numbers that, that we're gauged by, uh, you know, just living in this, uh, in this world of objective truth um, is, is an important driver of, of, reinforcement for us right right so just a a quick question so you weren't always an olympic weightlifter you were a real athlete before that i just i'm just kidding (laughs) what other sports did you play that's right i i uh i I wrestled and I played baseball and football and then I stumbled upon uh, the shot put in the discus in high school as a means to uh, maybe take a break from conditioning but still get out of PE. Sure. And um, lo and behold, by my senior year, I had more opportunities for throwing the shot in the disc than I did for any of my other sports. And so, uh, you know, that became that became a huge part of my life. Uh, as you know, I went to the the real USC uh, oh. to throw the shot one with this, and then uh, stumbled upon the hammer, and uh, and that was uh, that was an awesome adventure. Um, yeah, although, and that's where our adventure started together, right? Yes, I'll concede it now that you were that you were a much a much more superior hammer thrower than I was. <laughs> I'm glad we got that out of the way early on. I was wondering how that was going to work into the conversation. Yeah, okay. A bomb that was dropped at some point. You know, we were going to compare <laughs> PRs, and I just wanted to—I just wanted to pull my pants down right off the bat and say, "Look, you, you kind of beat me. You kind of de- disarmed me with that. I appreciate that." Yeah, that was... Bird had the bigger hammer marks. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. Well, the podcast is over. That was a good time. <laughs> so, so, okay. So you transitioned from, uh, hammer throwing, shot putting discus. And so was it a, a smooth transition from one athletic endeavor to weightlifting <laughs> or give us a little bit more of that yeah. side of it. And I, and, no, and I know a little bit more been smooth in my life. Everything is, uh, everything I have to learn the hard way. Uh, and so, uh, in 1996 to date myself and to give everybody a, a window into how old I am, uh, I got to, go to the world junior championships, uh, as a part of team USA. And, um, I had, a, I had a, I had a really stellar junior career and that's about where the, uh, zenith of my success in track and field stopped. So it was, uh, it was one of those things where I kind of got distracted by all of the, uh, cool things to do at, at, in and around LA and, um, in the South central Compton area, had it, had yeah, it rolling. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. There was I joined the gang, and uh, <laughs> there was uh, there was just too many turf wars to really keep up with the throwing. So uh, no, we uh, you know I I just got I just I just kind of got distracted. You know, life life just uh, basically took me uh, out of the zone, and um, you know it was it was it was um, looking back on it, you know, a lot of fun, but it certainly was not. Um, as fulfilling as it could have been. Mm. Um, and so when I graduated in 2000, um, you know, the games were, were, uh, in, uh, Sydney, Australia again. And I just, it just felt like, man, I really missed an opportunity to do anything special in the sport. Uh Um, so I figured, you know what, I'll just go and start my life and, you know, athletics were fun, but that's, I want to go be, you know, engaged in, in business and make money and, and, and have fun and maybe start a family and get down to a normal body weight. Um, so I didn't look like a pair. Right. So it wasn't uh, just the constant eating contest every day. Yeah. 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 I, I wanted to be one of the pretty people. Oh, uh, I mean, being in LA, you kind of get a, a, a weird sense of reality. I would think in <laughs> South, South Carolina, you know, it's a little bit more lenient. If you know, it's like the, there's like the South beach diet. Then there's like the Myrtle beach diet. 
<laughs> it requires jean shorts and uh, it requires all of the things fried and jacuzzi yeah and a, and a weird sunburn yeah so it's great <laughs> um so um what were we talking about yeah uh, your, your transition from a thrower uh to to basically someone who lifts just basically lifts weights was there a there was a, a, a chronological and experiential transition but i'd yeah, like to also great. know like what were the some of the things that you learned through that and maybe that's something we'll get to later as far as from a training aspect but let's hear the story first yeah so uh i graduated and um you know, this is so that the, the, the actual story is I graduated and I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. And a good buddy of mine who was a couple years older had just come back from uh, Kazakhstan and he had spent a few years out there after graduating working with his family uh, in the energy sector. So they were doing some of the first privatization projects in uh, Kazakhstan for their gas wells. And so he finished up with that project and, and he attended my graduation. He said, you know, this is what we did in Kazakhstan. I really feel like there's an opportunity in the LA basin to uh, go into mature oil fields with new technology and recomplete some of the projects and, and just get more from what, what, what's already there in the ground. And we'll just rely on the instability geopolitically for, for the oil price to go up and, and let's make these investments and, and create this company. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. Right. What, what, what uh, was this? What was the technology, ba- the layman technology that that was that that was looked at to achieve that? Uh, really, it was just you know doing doing good geological surveys, you know, using some of the updated uh, imaging techniques, and then looking at how wells were conventionally drilled in the '60s and '70s in LA. Uh, and then recompleting them with, you know, new perforation right, strategy. Right. They just, just overlooked just, a lot of the resource. Yeah, yeah. It was just a very under uh, underdeveloped area, you know, because, A, it's difficult to do anything in, in California from a business standpoint, especially with energy. So to make a long story short, you know, I got sold into this idea. I didn't really know what the hell I was doing, uh, but uh, I invested all of my college fund in this company uh, that my grandfather had set aside for me uh, because uh, I had earned a little scholarship. So everything that I didn't spend, I just plowed right into uh, to this company and, and we started accumulating uh, assets in the LA basin and uh, we raised a little money and one thing led to the other and we listed our, our little company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so we, we ended up uh, creating a, a lot of liquidity out of this little company for, for me and a couple of my buddies. And um, so with these concentrated stock positions, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go into finance and figure out how to, how to do a better job managing this risk. And, and so I parlayed my experience with uh, Pacific Energy into a career at Merrill Lynch um, as a wealth wow. management advisor. And, uh, and I really kind of took on all of our, our, uh, our friends, um, uh, assets and, and managed those in the, in the early stages. But, uh, a funny thing happens, right? When you think you've got the world by the balls, um, you know, we took a big swing for the fences with the oil and gas company and we created, uh, an acquisition, uh, scenario in Alaska where we bought a half a billion dollar asset from forest petroleum. And we, uh, had a, uh, had a bridge loan with silver point and Goldman Sachs. And, uh, we had, uh, uh, agreed to a bond to bond terms to refinance that bridge, and right as we uh, finalized the transaction, the economy just absolutely took wow. uh, a nosedive, and the credit market seized up, and there was nobody lending to anybody, and so essentially we got stuck holding credit card debt uh, on about four hundred million dollars, and so. When that happens, the short sellers jump in. And so we had this beautiful little company that we built from scratch that essentially got taken under uh, in, a, in a matter of about 90 days. Jeez. And uh, uh, we, were, we were okay all the way up until a, an actual volcano. An actual volcano. Right at the uh, – right, and, and, and sealed in the port that we shipped everything out of in Alaska. And so – uh, essentially, we had to file for bankruptcy, and the money that we created, uh, and we we all got a little bit out, but but we you know 
me who went from <laughs> from having millions to having zero money overnight. Wow. Um, and so, you know, it was it was during that time that I had I had already, you know, I had already convinced my girlfriend at the time that I, you know, having all this money, having all this success was just completely I was miserable. I wasn't it wasn't there was still some some void that was not filled by by all of the success and i you know i i lived large i did all the things that you want to do when you're young and have money i had parties at the playboy mansion i was back and forth to new york you know i had i had i had an apartment over there it was just all the things that you think you want right, to do you're you know, supposed to do in, in, yeah, yeah that you're supposed to do and you know what like i those things are fun but those things don't they don't fill you up. They don't make you feel fulfilled. They don't make you feel accomplished. And they just, you know, you can have a lot of cool things and do a lot of cool stuff and feel very empty and miserable. Um, and so I thought, you know, let me, let me stop you just for a second. That's really, really, really interesting. What was the cause or what was the, what the misery was, the, what was the source of the misery? Because that's, I think people really have to understand, like you, you live the American yeah. dream. You did what most yeah. people on I the planet would day. say, oh, like you said, yeah. world by the balls. You knocked it out of the park. You have access to anything you want, although you're miserable. Yes. I think that's, that's incredible. Unpack that for a minute. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't really know, you know, it was one of those things. It was just like something was missing. Uh, there was just, there was there was some sort of, of void that just wasn't fulfilled with all of these tangible things. And, uh, at the time I just started searching and it was like, where was, when was I happiest? When was I, when was I the most fulfilled? When, when was I, when was I living like my best life? Right. And, you know, I went all the way back to when I was a student and when I was, you know, in my early stages of, of, of USC, um, when I was, when I was having success and I was working towards a goal and I was like, I, I just, I just felt, I felt pure and I felt like I had direction and I felt like I was, I was accomplishing things that were important to me at the time. And so, so, um, so your business at the time, although you were growing an extremely, almost a vertical growth curve business that was very monetarily advantageous that that yep. didn't give you that uh sense of accomplishment or or, or fun yeah, very strange i just because you were winning I, I didn't right like, you're winning but i didn't feel like i was help, like i was helping uh, i didn't feel like i was making the world a better place i didn't feel like i was making myself a better person and there was these larger meta concepts that you know i mean i, I grew up a lot like you with you know mom and dad that instilled values in me that that, that never left and you know a, a lot of those and you can find this on my wall at home because i you know i have my my family values you know emblazoned in a piece of art but it's you know we have, a, we have a responsibility to be a good person is the is the first is the first line and so what does that mean to be a good person and so uh, i just felt like i was living uh selfishly and i just wasn't i wasn't inspiring anybody i wasn't helping anybody it was just i was just doing me right and it consuming just, one of the, yeah it would just just it was not fulfilling in any way shape or form wow uh, that that's that's in itself i mean kind of jokingly you could stop the podcast there and if people just understand that because you you've been to a peak or maybe a valley that most people have yeah. never been to and and I think, I mean, it's good for me to hear as well, you know, as, as things accelerate business wise and, and I know a good bit of very, you know, hyper successful, rich people as well as you do too. Um, and I'm not going to say all of them are the happiest people and that, that yeah. I know. And, and it's, so I've really find it interesting. I'd like to even know the process that you took, as you said, you went back throughout your, did, did you literally do like an, a, a chronological age regression in your mind? Go, okay, uh, 25. Nah, no, I wasn't that happy then. Uh, 24. Uh, it was pretty cool. And then you were like, aha, 18, 18 was when I was happy. Uh, how, how did that work? Memory is a funny thing. You know, like you tend to just remember either 
the last thing that happened to us uh, or we remember the most intense thing that happened right. to us. And so I basically just went to like those feelings when I had the most intense sensation of just just being alive and just like having the camaraderie with my teammates and working towards a goal and inspiring people and like, you know, just, just talking about how to be a better, a better athlete, how to be a better student, how to be a better, you know, just, just a better version of yes, yourself. Absolutely. Uh, and, so, and so I think that's what, you know, that's what's, that's what I was looking for. That's what I was searching for. And probably there were other easier ways to find that and nurture that. But the, but the low hanging fruit for me was, you know what, I miss being an athlete. Yes. And that's, that's, that's the bottom line. And so I, at, at, in 2004, I started picking up, uh, picking up the snatch and clean and jerk because that's what we use to train, uh, in the weight room for the throws in a lot of, in a lot of ways. So, you know, I was always a better weightlifter than I was a thrower. And, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to try to compete, uh, in that sport. And so wow. 2004, that's when, I, that's when I started, uh, I started, uh, picking up the sport and, you know, like I, to, I think I told this story at, at Summerstrong, a big catalyst for me kind of going back to my roots and, and as an athlete was Adam Nelson's performance in the 2004 Olympics. Oh man, so an athlete, for sure. Watching, yeah. Watching this dude just like overcome just, just so much adversity and just like his, his charisma and his energy and just something about the way he conducted himself as an athlete and as a man was just so freaking inspiring at the time. And, you know, I still, you know, I, I still have to, you know, every, every year I'll jump on the phone with Adam just to hear his voice. Cause he still just like, uh, inspires me in, in, in a variety of ways. Absolutely. That that's so interesting. Uh, and I agree. I remember it's kind of, if you're a thrower, you remember where you were in the 2004 Olympics. I mean, I was sit, sitting at Rockaways at a table of eight, right beside the TV and cheering at him on and smashing beer mugs on the, on the ground when, when that last throw went foul, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and it was just one of those, he's one of us. He's one of our guys and no, he's supposed to win right now. Yeah. This is supposed, this yes. isn't how this story goes. There's my guy on international TV in the oldest stage of sport that's still available and still on the earth. He's supposed to win and it yeah. just didn't happen. And, and yeah, that was, that was a heartbreaker. And, and I love how that you took that, that, that experience and passion and let it fuel you. And it's interesting. You were in a, 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 an arena that was extremely profitable, extremely high profile and very flashy and basically picked up the most thankless, hardest, poorest sport in the world. <laughs> Only yeah, hammer yeah. throwing and weightlifting. I mean, I would, I'm, I'm sure yeah. maybe I'm anti elitist in saying that, but I don't really know any other sports that uh, are, are more thankless. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so do you think uh, there was a little bit of uh, it, mentality that picked up on that intentionally or unintentionally that you wanted to almost punish yourself with the hardest damn thing to do that would have gonna would just gonna have zero money opportunity and and uh you were gonna lock yourself yeah. in a basement to be fair i didn't think it through <laughs> it would have been way cooler of a story but now you're probably kicking yourself again but anyway yeah. Yeah, exactly so no, at the end of the day, like, uh, that's what I did. And so, um, you know, what little money, uh, I did have, that's what, that's what I used to fund the, uh, the nonprofit to bring Abhijit about. I brought a bunch of other Bulgarian athletes out and I secured myself in a, in a garage and I lived and trained with these guys day in and day out, just trying to extract, you know, whatever information wow. I could. And, um, and going back to our initial, you know, uh, a couple senses on the topic, you know, what I learned from this guy was you've got to, you've got to be a free thinker. You've got to, you've got to stay true to your convictions. And, uh, if you want to blaze a trail, you have to find something that works. And, uh, ultimately, you know, what he stumbled upon, he did so by watching, uh, the American really? basketball team, practicing basketball oddly enough he was like he, he he would tell the story about when he was an athlete he would watch you know these uh these american basketball players you know 
create create these scenarios where they were forced to take this shot just like they would in competition and they were forced to take uh, this shot just as they would in competition and that's all they practiced was the specific aspects of what they needed and they didn't bother mm. with anything else and so his, his his extrapolation was well why don't weightlifters just focus on what we need and we'll just increase the tonnage and the intensity uh, until until they they just don't improve right. and so Turns out when you when you take a hyper specialized approach to uh, a sport that is incredibly uh, specialized, and you add a lot of drugs into the mix, like you can continue to make gains for a long time for a long until time. literally the wheels and come off. Until literally the wheels come off, or your athlete becomes you know uh, an alcoholic and you know is self medicating in ways that, that causes his own demise, um, which. Unfortunately, a lot of Bulgarian athletes met their met their met their early deaths as a result of just trying to cope with the the. Is, is that what is that what system, what but, brought on the alcoholism and the the substance abuse was the 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 coping? Uh, is it physically, mentally, spiritually? What what was it? All of the above. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about um, you know a system that was so extreme with regard to motivation structures that it just produced this this mountain of stress and pressure uh that was just you know always there and and it was uh you know it, it was it was too much for for the lion's share of the people that what, ever what type of stressors might uh, those have been besides obviously heavy tonnage and rigorous training schedule yeah, but the heavy tonnage could only be achieved by an extreme motivational structure. So the idea that, you know, in communist Bulgaria at the time, you could uh, afford yourself uh, opportunities for liberty through, you know, being successful on the national team. So you could see the West, you could travel, you know, you could, you could, you could, you could buy things you know from western countries and bring them back to bulgaria you could potentially live in in a city you could own a car like all of these just micro right. liberties that we obviously take for granted you know that is like that's you want to you want to oppress somebody and just squash their soul just uh, just completely take away those things and so you know that's what they were faced with if they weren't successful is they had to go back and live you know in the confines of whatever small town uh you know their family was 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 supposed to live in and do the same job that their you know probably their father and maybe grandfather did before them like the idea of just having zero options for uh any sort of again going back to fulfillment you know is such a such a powerful motivation structure so imagine the most intense pleasure juxtaposed against right. the worst possible suffering and that's what obviously i've had to work with uh as, as his, right which as is an enormous system. weapon and so and it's a huge, huge. If you weaponize it properly, like he did, you know, it was it was people would kill themselves in the weight room because uh, death was 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 you know just maybe a, a a small step above what your what your fate was if you didn't successfully lift the right. weights he was wearing. Right. I had a we so, we had a similar. Uh, I would I don't want to uh, minimize the that system whatsoever, but there were. There were a few coaches in the in the uh, U.S. that had a, a similar mindset, you know, and, and I remember having. Yeah. Um, I know Derek Woodsky and I share the same coach during a portion of our career, and it, it wasn't as brutal, but there was it was very um, leverage based where if you competed poorly, your life was basically shit. And if you competed great, then you were offered basically liberties and it, whether it would just praise or whatever. But but it was amazingly powerful. I remember Derek telling me about one time when uh, he threw at nationals and didn't get all American. And he said his tooth hurt during the competition. So he came home and the next day he had this the tooth jacked out of his head. And they, the doctor said, I could, the dentist said I could fix it. And he goes, no, F that tooth. That's what screwed me up. And he's like, to this day, I don't have a tooth there because I was so pissed off at it. He just tore his tooth out. And I remember thinking like, oh, I would have totally done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's just altered right. state behavior, right? That's that's that not being in a in a normal state but of what mind. What a powerful weapon! Um, Oof. 
It was, that's amazing. So, yes. Okay. So that was one of the pieces of the puzzle you learned. How did you take some of that and put it into American uh, weightlifting? Yeah. So I went as far from that structure as I possibly could go. Cause when we tried to implement it here using him as a guide, it why is that? Because there are other options because, because there's other options because you don't really, you know, the, 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 those external motivators right. are just fake in, in the absence of, of having the ability to actually, right. There, there are no the salt mines to send you to. Before. Exactly. There's no, so they're, they're, the police are not going to come and get you if you try to escape from the training hall, which is actually what happened in, in, in Bulgaria. Because you're property of the and state, so, basically. You know, yeah. So looking at, looking at, you know, our value system in our culture, in, in the United States, in you know the early 2000s, what, what did we have that was, that was, powerful to tap into that we could use uh as as a motivation structure and so ultimately you know the whole thing came back to uh intrinsic motivation and we need to figure out how to tap into whatever whatever compels the ceo of a company to try and summit mount everest whatever compels you know a person who has everything to 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 take on these tremendous challenges just because it provides them with this internal right. peace and satisfaction and it just, it just fills a void. And so how do we say, okay, fuck all the external motivators. How do we look within ourselves and how do we, how do we give that to athletes um, so that, so that they achieve because it's just right. important to them. And so that, that kind of psychology is where I really leaned in and tried to tried to create a culture that would support that that type of behavior. And so, uh, you know, a culture of accountability, a culture of understanding the why behind what we're doing, um, you know, a, a culture of, you know, instilling a sense of urgency that if you don't do this now, you know, your, right, time your shelf is going life to is a very real by. thing. Yeah. So just, 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 just educating and making sure that these things were prioritized in messaging. And, you know, we have very simple uh, meta concepts that we talk about at Cal strength with all of our athletes. It's wake up every day and become a better person, a better student and a better athlete. And if you can do that, like the yes. rest will take care of itself. Um, and so, you know, we still compete hard. You know, don't get me wrong. Like the, the culture at Cal strength is something we call, you know, a, a supportive competitive culture but it's still we want to win um but uh but we want to do it because it's important to us and we want to do it the right way and we want to do it with integrity and and, and we want to inspire other people to kind of take up uh the same approach right which and i've seen that uh from the outside and a little bit of the inside is just being around you guys and it, and it's very evident that that's the way that you look at it and it seems like a much more sustainable model not only for the individual athlete but for the system the longevity oh, yeah. of the system and you also don't have you know athletes wanting to come back and punch you in the face or, or something like that or 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 you don't read about them in the obituaries because of x y and z um right. so, i'm sure someone punched me in the face but you know that tends to fade and so right uh, <laughs> right yeah maybe who knows we'll see <laughs> yeah I, I i try i try and be a benevolent dictator but still you know when you're when you're a business owner coach, you still you still have some some dictator in you, and I do. You know that was one of the those were the other things that we did um, early on, just to kind of like reinforce our investment in the athletes. Was I think we were the first weightlifting team in America to, to put out stipends for athletes to be able to to train, and so just this wow. small measure of appreciation, like hey, you know what, like. I'm, I want to be in it with you. I want to, I want to, I want to be on the same side of the table with you. I'm going to invest in your journey, you know? So from a business model standpoint, I want to make money off weightlifting. I never want to make money off weightlifters. And so I wanted mm. to put together, you know, an opportunity where we were, while others coaches were, were trying to make money off of coaching. I was like, no, 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 no. We need to make money off of, 
off of the journey and off of weightlifting. These, these weightlifters, the, the, they have the nothing. sport in general, and we're all players in that sport. And, and yep, raising exactly. the whole thing and, and bringing value and creating more value to the whole market of weightlifting. Yep. And then thus, yeah, you're driving all the ships higher. Yeah. That's so brilliant. That was, that was, that was the overriding. That was the, what we call the long con is just, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, we could develop a breadth of, 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 of value from education to inspiration to entertainment. And, and then, you know, fortunately enough, we had, uh, technology on our side so we could scale that message and amplify it and put it out there. And so that's ultimately what, what helped us, you know, continue to sustain that, that model. Wow. Well, it's, it's no, it's no, uh, I guess question, you know, we talked about, uh, your coach that was blazing the trail and obviously you blazed the trail in a, in a completely different method, but it's awesome that the things that you learned probably technically were from him, but yep. you learned almost what not to do and what a failed system looks like specifically in this context, in this country, yep. in this time. Um, it, and it kind of brings me to the next question. You know, I've read and I've heard people call you the Godfather. Why do they call you that? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I've got that jet black hair and I kind of slick it back. So it looks, looks a little like a mafia, but you know, I think that I'll agree with that. The whole, the whole Godfather thing comes from the idea that you know, early on, I we were we were very tribal in our approach, and it's like going back to the idea be. that we keep our own counsel and we're not listening to other people, and we're not we're not we're not trying to trying to uh, make a better mouse trap. We're trying to make a brand new version of how to catch a mouse, and so it. it was one of those. It was one of those things where, you know, we were insulated and, and, and we did a lot of things that people didn't necessarily agree with. And so, you know, we always felt like there was that, that, that we were that we were almost, you know, breaking the law on some some level. But we were a family that we're going to we're going to we're going to be in the in the fight together. And so it became like a little mafia, uh, so to speak. And so that's where John North, I think, started calling me the godfather and somehow it, it, it stuck and. The rest is history. <laughs> well, I, I got to respect the way that you've looked at it. That's um, it's a very similar way that we've looked at it here at Sornex. And so, I, as you said, not making a better mousetrap, but create an entirely new method to catch a mouse. And that's that's that just speaks to my heart so much. And but in order to do that, like you said, you have to stay internally focused on your not only the goal, but rewriting the question. Like, what are we really yeah. here to do? What is what is and from your perspective was was olympic weightlifting from my perspective was creating strength tools and go hold on let's redefine what strength tools are redefine what this is this culture this community this market this whatever industry whatever it is and let's let's get back to the drawing board because maybe there's something that was totally missed um and there's a whole different way to do it And then on, like you said, it's the long con. And then it only takes about 10 or 15, maybe 20 or maybe 39 years to make that, to to make that actually be a viable um, cultural movement within the community. And may, you know, maybe the utilization of social media or, or apps or whatever accelerate that. But uh, I agree. You can't, you can't be out scouting. You know, I like the, I like the antennas up model. You're watching what's going on, but at some point you got to be a heads down welder. You just got to get to work. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I mean, that's why I think our two companies are so, so well aligned, you know, and it's like, uh, there's, that's, that, that's why my, my whole gym is decked out in your stuff because it's over-engineered and it's intelligent. And I know that there's always, there's always a different perspective that you apply to, to each one of these pieces of equipment that, you know, I, I appreciate. And, and, you know, I feel like, uh, there's, there's just no better company well, to, to be aligned well, with. Thanks. Than well, likewise, likewise, Dave. And, and I, I, I look back to, uh, we, we met in, uh, what was it? The green room over there. Uh, well, we met for the second time, uh, with over unbreakable. And, and yeah. I got talking again and catching up after almost 20 years and went out and visited you a couple of years ago and lifted together. And uh, it was just, it was fun. It was like getting to relive. Well, it's just old thrower buddies getting to train again, uh, get to enjoy it, but from a different, a different lens and a different, through a different set of eyes and getting to hang out with you and, and listen to your ideas of what you had about this community and about weightlifting. And it wasn't, 
It wasn't F this guy, F that guy. Those guys suck. These guys are weak. We do it the best way because that just gets so tiresome. And really, let's be honest, everyone's doing something kind of good or you have never heard of them. Um, And so it was just it was just a breath of fresh air. And I love the way that you went about it. And I think that's why we kind of hit it off so quickly, you know, although we'd known each other for a long time at that point. Um, I just had immediate respect and over the last you know multiple years, just getting to watch what you've done and interact with you guys. It, it's neat because it still cuts all the way to the bone. It, it was you're you, you are as advertised, which I appreciate. Yeah, that's uh, that, that, that authenticity is something we talk about a lot. Like there's not we can only be us. Right. Um, and so, you know, if, if our model was to work, it was just going to be exporting what was going on within the four walls of the gym outside onto the internet. It wasn't, we weren't going to put on a show. Right. We were just going to be, and, the, and that, and that, and that authentic, authenticity, I think is why people were initially drawn to us. Um, but, uh, I mean, we did have the benefit of, you know, being subject matter experts uh, in a field that very few people knew anything about <laughs> at the time when CrossFit started to, yeah. started to kind of advertise that the lists were, uh, were a good tool to train. Yeah. Uh, yep. So, so we, you know, I think that having a plan, having a, having having a philosophy in place, but being also reactive and being able to capitalize on new opportunities, um, is something that CalStrength's always been pretty good at too. Right. I, well, it, it sounds like something that Dave Spitz has always been good at. Um, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, let's let's be honest. But if you look at, uh, you know, with the bar, with the barbell wad or the combine prep or different online programming, you're one of the first first gems or people doing that for a multiple for multiple solutions not just crossfit or not just um combine prep or something i mean tell a little bit more about that because that was uh i, I met you and uh ben from train heroic that same day that, and and you were one of the first people on that platform the train heroic pr- platform which has become extremely um they're another one of our partners that they've become extremely uh successful and that they're a you know, they, they have a great thing going, but tell us a little bit about how you're running that side of it and how it integrates in with your gym and Cal strength as a, as a business. Yeah. So, uh, just again, being a little reactive as we, as we grew our YouTube audience over the years, you know, one of the prevailing comments was, Hey, how do we access your program? And so, you know, for, for a couple of years, we were trying to figure out how to democratize information and get it out there. And, you know, there were some online coaching solutions at the time, but they were very expensive. You know, people were trying to charge $150, $200 a month for this information. And I was like, this is the, just the wrong way to go about it. We need to, we need to go the other direction and just just make it affordable and democratize as much of this stuff as we can. And let's get a, uh, get, get a, get a breadth of people, you know, to create a, a bigger tribe. Right. And, Enough and people to, that actually know what's going on that you could create a market or an industry or a group or a tribe or anything. Right. Yeah. Cause the only way the online training stuff works and the only way is if, is if people feel a sense of connectivity, you have to be, you have to be connected to Wes Kitts. You have to be connected to, to Dylan Cooper and Christian Rodriguez and Nicole Lim, all, and all these athletes that we have in the gym. Uh, and you have to be connected to me and you have to be connected to those other people that are suffering alongside you doing this program and, and, uh, and, and enjoying the benefits of the games uh, as well. And it's just one of those things that that was, that was so important that we achieved some sort of critical mass where you're not just training, you know, in a vacuum, but you are, you are a part of something and, and that, that something is special. And so that's where, you know, Ben and Train Heroic came in is Ben actually took a, a seminar that I gave in Chicago with the express intent of recruiting CalStrength to, to, be, to be the first uh, participant in their subscription-based marketplace model. Wow. And so, you know, it's funny that the Godfather. two, you know, he saw me out and I was looking for, for, for yeah, he was, he was, he literally, I think he, to tell him, have him tell the story, you know, he scrounged up, you know, whatever the, the seminar costs, 150 bucks or something like that. And that was a lot of money at the time for the little company, but he was, he was going to go impress me enough with his athleticism and his lifting skills that I was going to, I was going to sign right there on the dotted line. <laughs> and um, and, and did you? Good uh, uh, I mean, I, I got to, I got to see some of like the, the early stages of the platform and most of it was, 
vaporware at the time. You know, it was a couple PowerPoint slides, but you know, I just, I just trusted Ben's ability to get the thing done, and and combined with his partner Josh, you know, they've just they've just done it the right way. You know, like Sorenex, like Calstrength, they're they're cut from similar cloth in terms of you know just 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 having a vision and being able to to execute on it to build something you knew and 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 I'm uh, I'm happy to have them as absolutely partners. yeah they've been great I I appreciate the 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 intro to them years ago um, okay thinking about vision you you just said what is the vision for for Cal Strength in the world of weightlifting. What is the, what is the, the vision, the goal, where, where are you going with this and, and who are the players? Yeah. So, I mean, our tagline has always been fighting the war on mediocrity. And so, you know, the United States has gone from being uh, basically an insignificant entity in the, in the sport to, you know, being uh, uh, playing a leadership role in making sure the sport stays in the Olympics. So, you know, we were, we were back against the wall, you know, uh, because of the drug yeah, issues. Un- unpack that, that a little bit, because really the, the last time prior to this, that the United States has been on top was the 1960s. I believe Tommy Kono was one of the last. So, yeah. so we yeah. had the golden era, which many call it the fifties and sixties. What happened? What's your father and can, and can talk about, uh, with unbelievable precision. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's a bit of a savant with that. But uh, so that's that's kind of cool that I grew up with that. But, you know, I grew up hearing about that. But my days in the weightlifting interest world were what I would consider the dark era of of a list uh, American weightlifting. What happened to create the dark era and what's happening currently to pull us out of it for almost a, a renaissance of sorts? Right. So, I mean, some of it's anecdotal and speculation, but, you know, what, what many say created the dark area was the, was the Nautilus machine revolution ah. that basically took barbells out of people's hands and took, took these, these movements that had worked very well over time. And, you know, we decided to go with these single joint strategies because ultimately people could make money off selling big, expensive pieces of equipment. And so, you know, the global gym model exploded and uh i think that combined with the fact that the united states primarily uh invested in in research that was uh, aerobic based so a right. lot of like you know heart health and, and things that were that were geared around uh, cardiovascular health um you know that basically further you know uh, uh was created a part of departure from just time-honored barbell movements. And so I think it was just a, a little bit of a lost art form that um, kind of people forgot right. about. So really and, the bodybuilder you know, world, uh, kind of like the video killed the radio star, the bodybuilder world in some yeah. ways killed the weightlifter. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, and, maybe uh, it's, it's the, you know, the, the, the Dave Drapers who, by the way, Dave Draper, when my dad was a, a, a weightlifter in 1965 through 68 in high school, um, Dave Draper worked out at the Elizabeth YMCA with he and Anthony DeTillo and a young Richard Soren and, and, and Des awesome. Oban, actually all three, all, all of them lifted the same gym, which is so funny because he went out and moved out to California and that was kind of the, they're really the kickoff of the the bodybuilding world in sunny California. Yep. Yep. Just uh, so funny that all these things are somehow connected dotted lines, but so it was, it wasn't in your opinion. A lot of people say, Oh, it was the drugs. Uh, All the the Russians and the Bulgarians, they just took more drugs. No, I think the the Americans, you know, took the same amount of drugs, uh, although it wasn't state sponsored necessarily, and it wasn't as sophisticated. Uh, it just there was just a lack of interest, and there was a, a, a lack of buy in uh, from the, the the community at large, and so you know, it just uh, I think it was just a it was just something that we we forgot. Interesting. And, too many other um, options. Too much fun. Too much seventies or what? Yeah. Yeah, all of those things probably combined, you know, and and then at, at some point, um, you know, there was there was this return to the basics. There was a return to kind of, I think, ground based strategies for developing athleticism and how powerful these tools could be uh, in helping you know other athletes across other sports, you know, 
develop all these all these uh, tools from mobility and flexibility to power and and strength to you know simultaneously training force production and force absorption you know all of the all the, the benefits that we know to be true about what the Olympic lifts can provide, I think that people started uh, just re-engaging from probably an athletic side right. first, and then ultimately that funneled all the way down to CrossFit and, and a fitness movement, and that kind of sparked a whole new level of interest. And I think that you know more people today, you know, when they say when I say okay, oh, coach weightlifting, they 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 know what a right. fractured jerk is. They don't. They don't yeah, let's go. How much do you right, bench? Right, that that's it's very interesting, and I guess you and I uh, again serendipitously were at the right age at the right time for that because I find myself at, that is an advantage in my career. Was you know I got out of college in '99, so I was training as an athlete much as you were in the mid to late '90s. Snatch, clean and jerk, plyometrics, a bunch of different uh, ballistic loaded exercises. And we, we as a culture kind of, kind of, I wouldn't say erupted, but at least rose up out of that bodybuilding hit, super hypertrophy machine based training in about the mid to late nineties. That was when the human performance side of training really came online when everyone goes, Oh, you could train to be a better athlete through these other modalities. And you know, I've said it before, I was just lucky to be born in the time when I came out of five years of college, walking into an Olympic trials, when training was my sport, basically, and was my life, right about the time when that was going to be a valuable skill to have. And it it was wasn't that I was smart to do it had I gotten out of college in 1984, I'd have been screwed. Um, Yeah, success is situational. There is there's there's no doubt that that's another one of the abuji of lessons is that you know you, you gotta you gotta be born at the right time in the right place with the right skill set if you're gonna if you're gonna be as successful as as you as you can be we we, we, we say you know you gotta plant your plant your seed in hospitable right. yes. soil yes and, and, and during the right time of the year and and so i think we both <laughs> benefited from that and then of course you, you know you 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 got weightlifting back online and it was probably trickling along. And then you had the monster of CrossFit erupt in the mid two thousands. Um, yep. and yeah, that, that puts you literally almost at ground zero for that. Is, is that what happened? Yeah, exactly. And then we just, you know, we developed a model, um, for athletes that, that picked up the barbell later right. in life. So when we refer to, stage adoption you know if you were to go and ask a chinese coach hey how do i get this 35 year old mother of two to snatch and clean a jerk he's going to look at you like you're crazy because that's just not something that you would do that's too it's too late there's no reason to do that like it's just that there was there was no there was no information at the time on on how to get that done and so you know with the situation we had, we had to develop a model that that was advantageous for these late stage adopters, and many of them, you know, transitioned out of other sports. So much like I did with throwing, much like uh, our best athlete Wes Kitts did with football, you know, there's some strength background, there's some there's some solid GPP right. uh, backing up, you know, his his in- initiation into weightlifting. But uh, but there's no there's no starting at 12 years old, you know, with the snatch and clean and jerk with perfect technique. There's let's 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 take great athletes. Let's solve for structural imbalances, asymmetries, teach them the movements and then figure out, you know, how to program effectively to get them to compete. Right. And And that's that's a little bit of a different challenge when you have an athlete walking in that's a 500 pound squatter. And now you're going, okay, take this lighter weight that you think is funny and do this other weird thing with it. Yep. And, and, and try and feel what your body's doing, you know, like that's a, uh, that's, it's, it's a unique challenge, but you know, it's with our population, we have such a such a huge uh, luxury in terms of you know having enough genetic diversity where we produce freaks and some of those guys and girls you know just 
they can do this stuff without right. having uh, started at, at, at age 10 um, and be very successful as, as evidenced by, you know, many of the athletes. Yeah, uh, with, with Wes, and, you know, and I guess I'd like to talk about Wes just for a sec. You know, how did Wes end up at Cal strength and, you know, he's, he's been on a, uh, on a bit of a tear recently, like what's going on with him and what's coming up. So give us a little bit about, about Wes. Yeah. So the, the Olympic, um, qualification for weightlifting like we talked about the, the the sport was on the ropes and the united states had to step up and really be uh you know play a leadership role with respect to the international weightlifting federation and the uh, ioc and, and and make certain concessions you know uh, that that would keep the sport viable in the olympics and so um the way the olympic qualification stands now is everybody competes as an individual um, whereas before we had to earn the number of spots uh, that we were allowed to, to to take athletes to the Olympics as as a country, so we had to accumulate team points. And now everybody's just evaluated as an individual. And so, uh, in the 18 months leading up to the games, every athlete has to compete six times at six international competitions, and you have to compete at least once in each one of these six-month windows. And so that are, that that are all drug tested, right? People, yeah, so that requires people to show up and be drug tested. So it, it levels the playing field in such an amazing way, and Wes has been able to take advantage of that. Um, so the United States, you know, having – a lifetime clean athlete like Wes, um, which is a huge distinction, Enormous. by the way, like they're, they're a clean, clean athlete, like an athlete that can pass a test is much different than a lifetime clean athlete. So like, I would love them to take hair samples or do to like, let's, let's, let's track it all the way back. Have you ever, have you ever engaged in any performance enhancing drugs? And yeah, and, clean versus pure. And, uh, right. Anyway, uh, different topic, but, uh, so Wes has, uh, Wes has completed two of those major uh, events uh, at the World Championships and then most recently at the Pan Am Championships. So he, he repeated as Pan Am uh, champion and he broke uh, not only an American record that was uh, 23 years old set by another guy named Wes Barnett, who's, who's Absolutely. an amazing athlete. Uh, he broke his clean and jerk record and he broke his total record. He also set the Pan Am record. So, you know, from a continental standpoint, uh, you know, North America, South America, no one has ever totaled more than that's him. awesome. And you know, some, some strong people in Cuba and, and Colombia and Venezuela, proud tradition. So he's on a tear. He's currently ranked ninth in the world and he is continuing to, to get better. And so I have, I have every confidence that West will be in metal contention in Tokyo in 2020. Excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he had that, he had that enormous uh, snatch that he pulled in uh, at summer strong 10 right there on the platform in front of everyone. That was, it was definitely a highlight. Um, I know one of your goal. Yeah. I mean, come on, that's as good as it gets. Um, hey, that's that's that is, that right? is definitely a Cal strength way to do it. Uh, so we have the goal of a world championship or, or at least, um, at least a medal. Uh, how much further do we? How, how much further have we come since that that Summer Strong Ten uh, lift? And then, what challenges lay ahead to cross that line of of that goal that you're looking for for not only West but for American weightlifting in general? Yeah. So since Summer Strong, uh, uh, he's put on just over ten kilos on his total, which is which is yeah, remarkable. That's huge. Um, and he's gone from he's gone from. Um, uh, you know, being the American record holder in the snatch to adding the, the clean and jerk to, to his resume as well and the total. So he finished uh, at, at one of the most competitive world championships we've seen in the weight class in a long time. Uh, uh, he, he finished 10th and, uh, and left, some, left some chicken on the bone in the snatch. So didn't snatch as well as he could have, but clean and jerked really big. And so I suspect that in this year's world championships, which is uh, going to be in Thailand in uh, September, that he's going to do something that shocks everybody. Maybe oh, his, his training looks amazing right now. 
oh, he's so, you know, it's like we talk about this all the time. It's like you have momentum and that momentum is fueled with love and gratitude on Wes's side. You know, he doesn't train angry. He trains. He literally trains with joy every single day. And it's like he's appreciative of his teammates and, and the infrastructure that Cal Strength provides and his opportunities. And it's just it's just so cool to watch an athlete do oh. it the right way psychologically it's so freaking healthy and it's so you know i just get i just get excited talking about it and it's just amazing to watch day in and day out oh that's awesome because an athlete like that as long as he stays healthy mentally i would it, it sounds like he's he's getting the things that he needs to be sustainable in that in that sport for a long yep. time so then it becomes a, a single pronged approach of really keeping him healthy because you have a really good, yep. you know, uh, framework set up otherwise. Yeah, no, he's uh, and staying healthy is a, it, that's an important consideration, and that's you know part of what we try and provide with the programming. You know, just uh, just continuing to you know operate on the ragged edges of his ability in the safest right. possible way, and just making sure that the right anchor dates are prioritized, and, and that we're that we're wrapping on the gas pedal at the right times, and you know. He's got he's got a, a quad plan that I built for him that we've been executing to to a T, um, and he just uh, he continues to just have a ton of momentum and and uh, you now he's got this training partner that we that we also brought on named uh, Christian Rodriguez and Christian made his first Pan Am games with us um, and uh, he finished fifth in okay. the Pan Am championships. So he's, 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 he's matching Wes, you know, almost lift for lift. And that's, that's exactly what you need for sure. Now is in your opinion is Wes, is Wes a freak? Is he a, 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 a genetic specimen that works really hard or is he a, a little bit higher than average genetic guy that's worked extremely hard and gotten lucky? Like where, where do you put him? Maybe he, we won't let him hear this part of it, but you know, there's different athletes to have different attributes and, 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 yeah. and some of the talent yeah. can just be ability to work hard and endure a lot of training. Oh, for sure. Like that's a, that's a, that's probably the most important talent component in weightlifting is your ability to kind of recover, um, you know, to recharge your CNS quickly and, and to get back into training. Cause right now he's running, uh, what are we doing? 12, 13, he's at 14 wow. sessions a week currently. So he does triple days on Monday and Tuesday, once a day on Wednesday, triple, triple workouts, Thursday, Friday, and then we'll work out on Saturday. And so you know, he is, uh, he is very talented with regard to adapting to his training, but physically just as a, as an athlete, yeah, he is, he, he is among the best athletes I've seen. He's probably top five, um, in my all-time wow. list of athletes in the last 12 years that we've had to work with across every sport. And, you know, we have multiple Pro Bowl athletes. We have, you know, multiple athletes that have run you know, in the four threes at the Combine. Uh, you know, we, we, we've had some some stellar guys, but, you know, Wes, Wes is up there, um, right there with him with regard to his just genetic potential, which is why I feel so comfortable rattling off, you know, his – his uh his prospects sure because the, the cloth is there yeah i know i know approximately where his genetic potential lies and so as long as we do our part you know it's uh it should be it should be just a uh, a mechanical exercise in getting him there right well that's nice when you could kind of break it down to something black and yep. white or binary um it, well with with and you've been around some freaky athletes and these amazing athletes as well as I have. And I was talking to Judd Logan, yeah. another thrower, which by the way, I'll have to, I'll have to make a, uh, a site that for, for some reason, former throwers seem to be, uh, the highest per capita strength conditioning coaches in the world for some reason. <laughs> but, um, every, well, that's obvious. Well, everyone knows that, but, um, so we, he made a good point. He said that in his opinion, every world world class or Olympic level athlete has some sort of alien quality circus trick, which means they could do something physically or mentally or something that's just so far off the radar of what everyone else could do. And it might not be to their sport specifically. Of course, if they're 
if they're lucky and they're in the right place at the right time, it happens to be their sport. Um, but is there something that, uh, like maybe Wes has, or what's one of the most impressive athletic feats that you've ever witnessed? That is just something that you go, I don't know this guy, he had a 45 inch vertical jump and he could also, or like, like Reese Hoffa, 73 foot shot putter could, could solve a Rubik's cube in under a minute and a half any day of the week. I don't know why he just could. I think we, we, one of our most popular videos is, uh, is Dylan, uh, Dylan, uh, Dylan Cooper doing a 300 pound clean and then squatting to the bottom, solving a Rubik's cube in about 12 seconds and then standing up from it and jerking it. Uh, so uh, see there, there's something there. I, it makes me wonder like what type of wavelength they're working off of. <laughs> yeah. And, and I had a conversation with, with not only Derek Woodski, but Zach Brown as well. And we talked about how we believe autism is a superpower, like X-Men type superpower that I mean, I, uh, I mean, that a like lot on of some level like there is like either a touch of adhd or a touch of i think we're all on the spectrum a little bit like uh at least us high, high performers um I, th- I think you almost have to be to be to be hyper successful or hyper focused in one piece um otherwise everything yep. is too average so let me let me let me answer your question with wes i think that uh, and this is okay i'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little deeper uh, on you but wes is uh, you know, he's got a degree in exercise science. He's super accomplished as an athlete in multiple sports. He's been a strength coach in his own right. And he's, he's, so he's incredibly smart and he's incredibly knowledgeable with his body, with training. His superpower is his ability to trust completely. If I say this is the right path, he doesn't use his superhuman brain to double check all my more and to, wow. and to, and to, even though his body's feeling like trash, even though, you know, things might not be going well, his ability to stay on task and trust is something that I, as an athlete, could never do. You know, this thing went right. Like, That's really so interesting. A sideways for me. I was like, well, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. I got I to gotta go and right. do all this research right. and do his job for him. Yeah, you start pulling out all these Russian yeah, books. You're like, ah, you ever did that? But that's that's such a common thing for a high performer, for a smart athlete. And Wes's yep. superhuman ability is to to be able to shut off his big brain and to be able to just trust. And that 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 is something that I will never fully Man. understand. Um, even in the wake of you know, I I'm not perfect. I know I've made mistakes from here and there, like maybe assigning a, a, an intensity that wasn't quite right or a rep and set scheme that maybe was a little funky for that exercise at the time, you know, um, but, but he's always just head down and done it. And then, you know, we can talk about what was, what the results were afterwards, but he, he just has that ability just to, to, to trust. That's incredible. And, and I, I don't, I don't know if everyone's going to understand how, how effective and how valuable of an ability that is that that's, that's amazing because I, I never could do that. I would, uh, I would ask a hundred questions and it wasn't because I was maybe not trusting, but I was so interested in it. I was trying to glean every little point that I could learn. Maybe so maybe it was that I, so then I could buy in yeah. more to in my core level and understand and I think it helped me later in, in business and then everything like that, because I ask so many questions, but I guarantee there's some times that my coach probably oh, wanted yeah. to kill me. Cause I was that a whole kid that was asking 50 questions, although I'm glad I did it now, but gosh, just to be able to trust that's, yeah. Whew, yeah, that I mean, is a superpower. Like coaching me as an athlete would have been like my worst hell as <laughs> that was either I was chasing the shiny penny and trying to figure out, you know, what, what, what was better than what I was doing or, completely yep. disinterested in like, well, uh, I'm just not, not going to take it serious. And so, you know, and, yeah. and weightlifting, right? and then weightlifting, I, I did exactly the opposite and bought in completely, uh, to a system that ultimately, uh, caused a surgery or two. Uh, at the end of sure. the day, I learned so much from it. And this is another cornerstone of our philosophy at Cal strength is there's you know, a big difference between regret and disappointment and understanding that regret lingers, disappointment fades and that as long as you don't regret your effort and your part in the story all will be right with the world because the the regret is internal whereas disappointment tends to be driven from external agency right 
something that you couldn't necessarily control. Um, uh, Sure. So that, that, Sure. Like, like the, the disappointment that I threw the hammer further than you, <laughs> not that the regret. <laughs> that is all stuff that I would do. <laughs> internal factors. We all know who's actually stronger and who can, who can prove it. Uh, that is no question. Dang it. Dang it. Just, all I, right. I, well, I was 40 yesterday to, to, to be there. To did you really? The, the challenge. You're such a jerk. All right. All right, I'm going to have to have you train me, uh, coach me again, because I, I can't not be able to clean three blues if they've yeah, well, the yeah, I mean, there's, there's all these programs online that you can leverage and all. You can join the community. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I, I have. Okay, so talking about some of the X's and O's, um, I kind of I, I like asking questions like this. So uh, what is your staple exercise for weightlifters? If you, if meaning staple, like this is never leaving the program because it has such a high correlation and right. carry. So outside of the, the basic snatch clean and jerk. So we, you know, we have Olympic variations obviously. And so, you know, that we could talk, we could talk a great deal about those Olympic variations, you know, whether it's, you know, high hang work or whether it's, you know, not moving your feet, right. no feet snatches, you know, there's, there's a lot of that stuff. Um, but I would say that, that the answer is different for different uh, abilities. And so, oh, interesting. Yeah, in the, and then we can talk about the difference between, you know, those Olympic variations and strength variations. So, you know, what we would refer to as accessory movements. So, um, say, say best exercise for weightlifters, because I want to ask about athletes in general, the okay. next question, just to give okay. you a. So heads for, up on for, that. for for weightlifters that are just starting out, the, the the staple that will never leave our program is starting with non ballistic variations of the Olympic lifts. So that sounds counterintuitive, but the idea that you know it's a very clear principle of neuroscience: the the faster a movement is, the less precise it becomes. And so being able to start sure. with slow muscle variations to ingrain proper sequence of extension and proper arm mechanics through the movement that will never change uh, as a staple teaching wow. strategies. Um, no, that's really interesting because some of uh, my friends that are in the different uh, special operations command, uh, whether the seals or, or wherever they're one of their first things they do when they're shooting their pistol every time. Now these are guys that are highly, uh, you know, been in, been the teams for years or whatever it may be. It's a, it's a slow draw to a target three, three feet away or sometimes even three yards, but slow draw, dry fire, slow draw, dry fire. And you look, I'm going, dude, you guys are like the best right. of the best. And, but they go back to that really slow, non-ballistic right. movement to, to grain in those patterns yes. every time. I, I just think that's, that's so critical. And especially with teaching athletes, you know, or, or people who are picking up the movements for the first time, you know, the idea that you could just, you know, jump and catch or pull and pray and, and, and just have the weight mm-hmm. somehow magically arrive either on a front rack in a clean or overhead in a snatch. It's just such a bad strategy, you know, the athletes need to be mm-hmm. trying to accomplish fundamentals every step of the way until you get to those higher levels of, of skill acquisition. But even then, we will we'll dial, dial back on on technique days and, and break it down and go slow. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Okay. How about for best exercise for athletes in general, whether it be, uh, I mean, we're not going to say like distance running, but so, say, um, baseball, football, basketball, shot put, regular, regular people yeah, sports. I think, that, I think that the most important thing that we, that we always need to do is sprint. So, you know, whatever variation of sprinting you, you do, whether it's a hill sprint or whether it's, you know, 30 yards, whatever it is, keeping sprinting in a program is just mission critical. And especially, uh, as you get older, you know, if you're talking about older athletes, it's one of the first things we stop doing. And it's just one of those things that's just so instrumental in, in, in creating great adaptations from the inside out. Um, I really feel like, like it's, it's, it should be in everyone's program. Well, with the last two answers, you've totally changed my program. So, all right. Anyway, <laughs> um, okay. What it, 
Yeah, yeah. Go. Uh, so, what is the most underrated exercise in your opinion? Uh, the most underrated exercise is any sort of isometric variation in the squats. So, especially like from a front squat standpoint, you know, learning to be able to just be and and be calm under under a heavy load is so critical. So like if we assign like a five uh, unrack five second isometric hold front squat, one second pause at the bottom, come back up five second isometric hold, just, just being able to not panic with a low, right. be able to hold pressurization while you're, while you're maintaining, you know, decent breath, like that, that, that type of thing I think is very, people panic and they want to, they want to get rid of, of, of heavy weights quickly. And uh, I think that, just being able to exist. Um, yeah, that's interesting that you say just be. Uh, um, years ago, when I was when I was training for Highland Games, I was trying to bump my front squat up, and one of the methods that we did, I'm, I guarantee it's. I, I know I'm not the one that came up with it. I'm sure you do it or whatever. But we used to call them front grunts, yeah. and you just took this ridiculously heavy amount of weight, and you you took it six inches off the in from the front rack position, and you just held it. And, you know, at 230 pounds, I have 600 pounds on my chest and it's just crushing you. But after a while, the front squat went up because 450 something wasn't heavy anymore. I wasn't afraid of it. It didn't crush my spine. It doesn't didn't scare me. I didn't wobble with it. And uh, it was interesting. You just learn how to leverage your body into positions that you could support an enormous amount of weight and and you don't panic. So just just being is interesting. Yeah. Maintaining pressure. That's awesome. How about overrated exercises? Uh, overrated exercise would be uh, anything that prioritizes like unilateral movements over heavy bilateral movements. So I'm wow. a huge fan of, of symmetry and balance. And, you know, after we've done our heavy bilateral squatting movements or pulling movements, we definitely do some unilateral activities, especially when those big prime movers are fatigued, like being able to kind of continue to work some of those right. stabilizers and, and some of those some of those smaller motor units. But but thinking that anything unilateral is going to be a sufficient substitute for heavy bilateral compound movements. Um, very overrated in terms of, of their effectiveness in that way. So and we might have to edit this out later, but that would almost be in the exact opposition from my limited knowledge of like a Mike Boyle's exactly. view on, on a heavy squat being, I wouldn't say useless, but less useful than something, a rear leg Bulgarian or something like that. But I find it interesting because you, you said before that your best, the best exercise that athletes should do would be sprinting. So, uh, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, but you're saying that uh, to not overlook the heavy bilateral movements but that also being an important part of the sprinting training. Is that, is that accurate? Right. So just taking the benefit of those heavy bilateral movements um, and then utilizing them to create the, the strength adaptations and then taking those strength adaptations and, and creating the symmetry and balance and the, and the level of function that you want is mission critical. And so through, through the sprints, you're almost working the two opposite ends of the continuum. Absolutely. Gotcha. Absolutely. You're never going to create the same sort of, of stimulus with a unilateral movement as you are with a heavy bilateral movement and learning to strain under big, heavy loads, you know, holding positions. So we talked about isometrics, but just learning to hold positions under a big strain and being able to power through them while holding your posture uh, is very important too. Like that's a that's a whole other level of of of, uh, of stimulus that I feel like we need to have in the program. Right, and, and I, I do agree with you. I know I was mo- my most athletic when I was squatting a bunch. Uh, a bunch of weight and, you know, got, got out of it a little bit because of injuries here and there, there, there is, I agree, there is no amount of functional training or balance training or anything like that, that, that out, that out does a, you know, a a good sprint and a nasty squat. Uh, Just, it's hard, it's hard to get around that. Um, 
that's that's really really interesting and and you know and that being said let's i want to remind the listeners that you've had a i know i see you every year at the combine because you have athletes there yeah. uh, and so i i, I want to make sure people realize and remember that you know, it's not you're not just training olympic weightlifters uh, that you've been very successful in creating uh athletes to play on monday night as well yeah and some of our some of our some of our best work is done in the agility drill so we had the all-time nfl scouting combine record the l drill up until i think last year i think it's, it's wow. almost 10 years we had uh you know we have some of the fastest times ever run in the 5 shuttle so you know i'm i'm, I'm very uh i'm very aware of what is required to develop that that multi-dimensional athletic approach. So we're not just moving bars vertically. You know, we we understand the nuances of of, of how the body needs to behave um, in multiple planes. Awesome! Wow, well, we're we're getting we're a little over an hour right now. I guess my one of my last questions would be: What is the goal of Cal Strength in the next few years, and especially leading up to the twenty twenty Olympics? And maybe we've already we've already showed we've already talked about that, but just. Give us a give us kind of where you guys are headed and what Cal Strength is is looking to do in the world. Yeah, I mean, I think that just continuing our our efforts to educate, inspire, entertain people, um, you know, using using our athletes as as role models, um, not just for you know what to do in the weight room, but how to do it, and you know, mm, understanding yeah. that that intrinsic motivation structure is so pivotal. Uh, to becoming the athlete that you're capable of because the one thing that I as a coach always try to maximize is just how close we can get to each and every individual's athletic potential. So what is your genetic what is your genetic potential and how can we move closer to it? And so how and why uh, you know, that's that's what Cal Strength is is there to is there to kind of fill in those holes and to continue to fight the war on mediocrity and and to do that, we have to have quantitative data points uh, that back up our messaging. So, winning medals at international competitions, continuing to yep. create you know Pro Bowl performances on the on the NFL side, you know those, those types of things, um, they're not going away anytime soon. Right, right, and they're, they're, you can't argue with them, and that's that's the most beautiful part about it. You can't get an internet war about it. It's just it is what it is. Yeah, objectively. Um, this is what we do. And, uh, you know, go ahead and go ahead and say what you will, but yep. Objectively, here's the result. That's awesome. The result. Well, well, Dave, man, if, if, if just this hour and, and a little bit just flew by, um, I know we could probably sit here for another couple hours and probably will over a beer here sometime soon. Yeah. Um, I loved having you on the show. I love you to come back anytime. I love you to come back to Summer Strong again at some point, whenever works out for your schedule. When you're not changing the world of Olympic weightlifting in America, but uh, anything uh, you could tell people how to find you, whether it's uh, all your your different handles and and uh, you, you tell them where to get you. Shoot, uh, yeah, we definitely need to make another appearance at Summer Strong. I, I plan on doing a victory lap in 2021. And Summer yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely be on the list if you'll have us back, and we'll uh, of course we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get that USA chant rolling again. Um, but uh, you know, the website is CaliforniaStrength.com. The Instagram handle is at Cal underscore Strength dot com. Uh, on YouTube, it's a uh, California strength. So there's, we try to make it pretty easy for us to, uh, to, to be found. So, um, and on train heroic, they could pick up some of your programming yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, That's an easy thing, way. Not, not trying to make a plug, but it's a, it's a great resource. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. The train heroic uh, app, you know, we, we put just about every type of program that we have available at the gym online. So whether it's ground force, uh, in our athlete, um, models to, uh, more like fitness and general, general strength models with the barbell wad, or whether it's, you know, tried and true Olympic lifting with our club and elite program, we have all that stuff, you know, at 15 to $20 a month. So like we talked about democratizing information, making sure people have access to it and provide connectivity and, and, and fulfillment and come join, come join us. Awesome. Well, as you well know, here at Sornex and, and me personally, I believe in having extraordinary experiences with extraordinary people. And this is one of those cases. I appreciate you being on the show. And until next time, you guys go out and be legendary. All right. Thanks, Bert. Thanks, Dave.